This is Dr. Tammy Dean, and you are listening to the Equity Hour podcast. I am so excited to be here with you today. My goal is that as a listener, you leave with new ideas, resources, and actionable steps for your educational community. Let's explore how we can use our voices for equity and social justice today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Dragonfly Rising podcast with me, your host, Dr. Tammy Dean. I am super excited. Uh, Today, our special guest is Dr. Brandon Thornton. He is a high school special ed English and math teacher from Bloomington High School in Bloomington, Illinois. Brandon, welcome today. Hi, happy to be here. We are so excited. Brandon, like, does some amazing DEI and equity work and has worn lots of hats. And he's going to share a little bit about that work and some some tips with us today. Brandon, one of the things I love to ask everyone when they come on the podcast is around your personal equity work journey, because I believe that this journey is a, a marathon and it's constant and it evolves as we learn more and do more. Share with us a little bit about your experience and your own equity journey. Sure. I think I'm probably a- along the lines of a lot, like a lot of listeners who, you know, DEI, we probably knew it was here before it became a buzzword, right? And so for me, I've always known about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And of course, it's taken different names over the decades. But my journey is is pretty pretty unique. I feel like as an African-American teacher, you know, there's not a lot of people who look like me. And that's been my entire experience. Even as a kid, I was one of four Black students in the honors English classes. When I got to Illinois State University, I was the only Black person who was majoring in mathematics education. So my whole four years, never saw any other person that looked like me in the undergraduate program. And within the honors program at ISU was the same kind of situation. And then when I became a teacher, once again, (laughs) maybe one of five, and I teach in a district that is the third most diverse district in the state. And so for the staff to not match that, it was kind of disheartening. But still, that was my truth, right? That was my, I've always been the only Black guy. And so I never really realized it was problematic until I started my master's program in special ed and then eventually my doctorate in special ed where I started reading that this was a problem, (laughs) which is kind of funny because it didn't feel like a problem until I was reading about myself. (laughs) Well, yeah, because you don't know what you don't know. And if that's your lived experience, it is what it is. What what drew you to being an educator? Sure. So despite teachers not looking like me, I still had wonderful teachers. Honestly, my first teacher that looked like me was in third grade. Her name was Miss Johnson. And then I had Miss Michael later on. And both of them, I remember them standing in the hall greeting kids as they came in. And it just felt like I was at home. It felt like I was finally, I don't know, I never felt any different from my other teachers, but it just felt special there. They look like my mom, you know what I mean? So I, it just felt very comfortable. But I was still too young, didn't really understand, like, oh, I could be a teacher. It really didn't hit me until high school. I had really great math teachers who would, I guess I was a nerd because I was in my lunch in math class talking to them. And because of that, they would often have me coming after school and just help other students. And I really loved that feeling of helping others and and them saying thanks and it feeling like, oh, wait a minute, I could do this as a career. And so that's kind of what happened there. And then the same thing was true for my English classes. I never felt othered in my English classes. And so I was kind of on the fence, like, should I teach math or English? And now I get to do both. My mom, obviously, she was the first teacher that I knew. She owned a preschool. So growing up, I always knew that I was either going to take over the family business or do something else. And then it didn't really turn into high school until I went to high school. So. And then you thought, I like these high school kids. Yeah. And obviously I had to work in the, in the summers at my mom's preschool. And I kind of knew, oh, I can't do this age group. There's no <laughs> way. <laughs> you know, it's funny how we find our niche. I remember subbing when I first finished my undergrad to be a teacher and first graders are great 
love first graders. I had to be in a kindergarten class. I was like, nope, nope, nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bless you, kindergarten <laughs> teachers out there. You are amazing. I can even handle the little toddlers, you know, but I don't know. Mm-hmm. Something about that kindergarten, that's a special. Yep. But I taught middle school too, right? And people say the same thing. They say the same thing about high school. Everyone yeah, has their, yeah. Comfort their zone. group. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I want to come back to you, something you were saying about as you move through your master's and then into your doctorate, and then you started reading things. Um, really curious how and what you were reading and what and how that in- influenced where you've moved into your equity work today. Sure. So disproportionality, right? I, that wasn't a word to me. That's not a word that people just throw out on social media. It's not a word. You have a casual conversation. What do you think about disproportionality? So I had never heard of the word until I read about it. And that word was always attached to blackness, right? There's a disproportionate percentage of Black and Hispanic males who are being disciplined more than their peers. And so I didn't even understand what that meant, but it was everywhere. It was on all these articles. And so I kept reading it, and, and then I just kept wondering why, like what every article has the recommendations, and it's always like, we need a more diverse teaching workforce to combat mm-hmm. this. And so I just, I obviously that's an obvious solution, but for me, it was like, yeah, that's true. Why don't we have more people who look like me in the classroom? Mm -hmm. And then I just fell on this rabbit hole of, is it systemic? (laughs) And then kind of paused, took a little break, because it is overwhelming to learn about the world's problems. Like, you can't solve them. But the whole thing with George Floyd propelled me back into that work. I was in the middle of my doctorate work at that time. And a lot of things were happening with alumni from my school who were coming back and, and having demands for the district to say, A, we need a more diverse curriculum, and B, we need a more diverse workforce. And to see Gen Z kind of rise up and demand these things kind of forced me to be like, you should do it too. <laughs> no reason I shouldn't. That kind of like get me back into it. The reason I took a break from even like thinking about all the things was because I was a subject of a lot of FOIA requests. For those <laughs> listening, that's the Freedom of Information Act. And it wasn't like I was up to anything sinister. I don't think. I don't know. You know, <laughs> after, after you probably time, were not. But perception sometimes doesn't always equal reality. And people. it really was. It was the perception because my name was attached to several different student leader groups, not in our school. Things that kids were having demands on. Maybe I was adjacent to them. I coach speech and debate. And so a lot of those kids were in speech and debate. And so my name just kept coming up. I spoke at a gun rally. And so all these FOIAs are digging for things about Mm -hmm. critical race theory and DEI. (laughs) And at the time, I didn't really have anything to show for it. Like critical race theory, we don't do anyways. But like DEI. We don't do critical race theory in school? (laughs) That's not a thing? Shocker. Plot right? twist, y'all. That's Plot not a twist. thing. It's not it's happening. Literally. Your children so. are not earning doctorates, y'all. They yeah. are not talking about critical race theory. Exactly. So, yeah, that was kind of my like, okay, I I need to be doing more. People already think yeah. I am anyways, and so I might as well. Oh. You're like, <laughs> let me meet your expectations right. and just put my hat back in the ring. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. You know what else I love about what you just shared? I think sometimes Gen Z gets a bad rap Mm -hmm. about things. And I do appreciate their willingness to use their voice, the things that they feel passionate and compelled to share their voice about. And Mm -hmm. that's one of the missions and messages of this podcast itself is use your voice. There is power in your voice. And when your voice connects with others who are also using their voice, it just exponentially has the opportunity to change some of the systemic systems that have been in place. Absolutely. And make people aware, right? Because maybe you grew up in them. You don't even know, recognize necessarily some of the oppressive systems that are there because they've just been there. Right. Yeah, And that's a very good point because at the start of the pandemic, all we had was social media. We were all quarantining. And so a lot of people in my life were confused. Like, why are kids making demands in the school? George Floyd is this isolated event. 
And so I kind of had to help connect them to George Floyd happened because perceptions of black males and these perceptions are because of these things that we let slide for so long. And it's hard for them to get ahead because of the systemic issues. And so I really had to be vulnerable and share my truth through letters to the editor and poetry that I was sharing about growing up with microaggressions, hearing things like you're really eloquent for a black person or I, you know, I didn't really like black people until I met you. People would say that to me all the time growing up. And I used to think it was a compliment. People still tell me like, oh, you're like an Oreo, black on the outside, but white on the inside. That's why I'm oh like, my you. God. like, you're cool. People say that still like it's some compliment. Like I should be like, yay, I'm white passing, even though that term doesn't even matter, like match what I am. And so <laughs> right. I had to call those things out. And I did hurt a lot of feelings. People would text me long apologies, even though it wasn't about them, but in their own reflective journey. Oh, I, I used to say things like, you're my only black friend. And I didn't know that would hurt you. And I'm like, it is hurtful because why am I your only black friend? We <laughs> like, right. What? Right. So, and, and I'm sure there was some of that. Why well, I'm a nice person. So I can't be biased. Mm-hmm. It's coming from a good place. I like mm-hmm. you. We're friends. Mm-hmm. That narrative that tends to reoccur around some of those right. microaggressions. Yeah. 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 And that's why it's a microaggression. Of course, you don't intend, but it well, hurts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. still stung. <laughs> and, well, and connects back to your implicit bias because you don't even necessarily realize why that's a microaggression. Right. right. You know? I think online, there are not microaggressions. People know exactly what they're saying when they say it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. The power mm-hmm. of hiding behind a screen mm-hmm. has brought out some very interesting conversation Mm -hmm. or use of words absolutely you know which is interesting because it was always there it was just maybe more subversive so is it better Mm -hmm. is subversive better or is it being overt that is better in that can we make more change when it's being there being overt versus subversive yeah i kind of think overt it's hurts but it's better because now there's evidence now we can screenshot i'm like okay we can call people in more. We can acknowledge that it exists now. Like it's easier to track now. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. It's like a, it really is a conundrum. It's like a mm-hmm. good for that to maybe prompt the conversation and bad because it's just that emotional toll like you were talking about earlier. Yeah. It's, it's just there and it's exhausting. And, and doing this work, while it's important, really does take a lot of personal emotional energy so you hopped back into the ring (laughs) did some policy work and you know wearing kind of doing what you do with students with supporting the students with advising or because student groups need a teacher to Mm -hmm. you know what's the word i'm looking for super supervise for lack of a better word Supervise them, right? They have to have an educator there that's responsible for them. And then you were doing some personal work. I'm sure there are teachers on here that are like, how do I balance those two worlds? Sure, yeah. Balance is a good word, actually. And that's what I had to do. Me, personally, um, I didn't really want to mix my policy work with what was happening in school. I Both were DEI-centered, but... The clubs that I sponsor, our school is very, our district attorney is very intentional. They're, they're called student led clubs and that's the, the sponsor just opens up their classroom. And, and so a lot of the things that the students were fighting for were adjacent to what I was doing, but I was intentional and in not saying we should do this. And so really they just inspired me to act once I took off my teacher hat. Although I guess we don't have teacher hats anymore. They're like permanent nightcaps. I don't know. Once I. <laughs> Oh, I don't want that power down. We power down. Is that- <laughs> yeah, not even, not even that. You just used social media as a way to say what I said. Or mm-hmm. my Instagram, I opened it up. Anyone could follow me. Students, parents, teachers. Facebook was where I would share my draft to the public letter to the editor. I would always repost things I was writing. But still, my work with the Racism Free Schools Act, no one knew about that. But that was something that I was secretly doing on the side 
because I just didn't want to have to explain myself. I knew what was important and the, pe- the team people I was working with knew what was important. And that was all I needed. I didn't want to have to explain to people outside of teaching why we need policies in place where students can report racial harassment just in the same way they can report sexual harassment. I didn't want to have to explain other people because the word race was still dicey at the time. And so I was very intentional on keeping that to myself. That way I, I could still feel excited about it. You know, when you when you share certain things with people, then you got to like defend it so much that it just becomes, oh my goodness. And so I didn't, if you ask my principal, he probably doesn't even know that that happened. That that happened. Uh, well, it sounds like you didn't want to feel like you needed to ask permission, right? Mm-hmm. Is it okay mm-hmm. that I'm doing this? Because it definitely yeah. is okay. So tell me a little bit about, for the people that don't live in, in Illinois, the racism-free school policy and that advocacy work you were doing. Sure. So this was this was led through a pro- program called Teach Plus. Teach Plus is national, but this is for Teach Plus Illinois. And Teach Plus, their whole goal is to take average teachers and teach them about educational policy. And so each cohort has to come up with something they want to change. We wanted to tackle teacher recruitment and retention for teachers of color. And we started dreaming of how can we do this? And then ultimately we realized we're trying to recruit teachers, but the current landscape is, isn't really accessible. Like it's not approachable. There's mm-hmm. so many things happening across the state that schools might not be a desirable place for people of color. And so then we kind of thought about, well, let's take a more, let's take a step back and let, let's ask why. And then we landed on, we need policies on place to protect students and teachers from racial harassment. And during that time, there were so many viral things happening. There was the school in Rock Island where football players hung a banana underneath their only black players locker. And the parents were going to like move forward. And then overnight they said, we don't want any more attention and we're please just leave us alone. And so no justice was served because it went viral before the schools could see what's happening. It happened in Southern Illinois where a student track coach called her a monkey out of... There's more to the story, but essentially she was running barefoot and she made her... She compared her to an African and then a monkey. And so once things go online, once things hit Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, mm-hmm. now we have public opinion and now the privacy is leaked. Both of those students' names are all throughout the media, even though there's laws protect their privacy. And so right. we thought, like, that never happens with sexual harassment. It's private. It's slow. You investigate. Both parties have a chance to say their peace. A resolution is made and we can begin to heal. You can't do that when everyone's talking about it in the comments and resharing. Yeah, the court of public (laughs) opinion is not. There's no mercy, really, in that social media Mm -hmm. court. Whatever gets put out first is always the the truth. That's 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 it. Yeah, that's the truth. It could be crazy and all the way out in left field. And, and it's so hard for anybody to recover. Yeah. From the that. perpetrator and the victim. It's hard. Yeah. Because now you're going to get defensive and there's no opportunity to learn from what happened. You can't learn from the harm you caused. So right. that's essentially what the Racism Free Schools Act is going to do. It's going to mandate that schools have a policy in place. It's not mandating training. It's not mandating curriculum. It's just schools need to have a policy in place that they distribute to staff and parents and families on what to do if you think you are experiencing racial harassment and the same way we display what to do when you are experiencing sexual harassment. So it's it's that that's all it is. The Anti-Racism Schools Act feels very like they're teaching critical race theory. And so I just didn't want to go through that. But that's what I'm going to drop a resource in the show notes about what is critical race theory and what is not. (laughs) <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop that for y'all because, and those of you listening probably know, but for those of you that maybe are listening and don't or want to know, I'm going to drop that for you because I think <laughs> it's important to know what the difference is and what it isn't. Absolutely. But yes, it does, right? And even that term like anti-racist, people have this emotional response mm-hmm. to it. And I get that because it can feel very personal. Yeah. And 
I think that's one of the important pieces of this policy. It gives an opportunity because there's emotion around this. And whenever humans are in their emotion, it's hard to be logical or listen to another person's perspective. And I think that's one of the really key pieces of DEI work is one, you got to get awareness around yourself and understand your own personal emotional triggers so you can take a step back when you need to in those moments because you're going to have them. You are because you're a human being. And it's connecting, you know, it, it's oftentimes personal or feels personal, even if it's maybe not personal because policy is not personal, but it affects people personally. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love that. Oh, we get delve deep. I'm loving this <laughs> conversation. I, I'm excited that there is policy in place because when we come back to even the beginning in your journey, we're talking about why is there not more diversity in schools? And we have to think about historically speaking, how welcoming have schools felt to persons of color as they went through school? And if it's not welcoming, why on earth would you choose to do that? And yeah. Why better? would you come back? Yeah. Why, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. Yeah. And so I think policies like this are really important. I think building awareness is important. I think community and understanding the families in which you partner with as an educational institution is important. Yeah. You know, moving away from assumption Mm -hmm. and getting into this cultural competence just because student Y looks like me, or I think maybe came from the same kind of background and upbringing doesn't always mean they're just like me. Like, right. Right. How do we, value these different ways of knowing and being and acting in the world and interested in learning more about equity coaching for you or your educators sign up for a free connection call with me dr tammy to discuss a personalized plan the link is in the show notes that's a good point because i made that mistake when picking diverse texts because I thought, you know what, this book is going to resonate with them. And because it's a black boy and it did it, <laughs> it did one year, but it did <laughs> with the next group because the, their lived experiences just weren't the same. I don't know if you read Long Way Down, but that was the book I chose. Because, yes, I love that yeah, book. I love it too. And I thought like it would, but when I did it, we did it with our co talk kids. They loved it. And a lot of the kids, we're, we're rec- recalling their memories of their lived experiences and how it kind of matched with what the main character was going through. And I thought, I'm going to slide this over next year to my instructional group. And it just didn't. They didn't. They couldn't get past the rule. They didn't, couldn't get past of, what do you mean you should take revenge? What do you mean no snitching? Them, their, li- their lives. Like, like <laughs> it just wasn't connecting. And that's the first couple pages. And so, yeah. It really just turned into a complicated poetry unit for them when really I wanted to, to like, I wanted them to feel seen. So don't make assumptions. <laughs> Lessons <Yeah>. learned. <laughs> yes. You know what they say about assumptions, y'all. <laughs> yeah. about assumptions. So, yep. <laughs> oh my gosh. So I want to talk a little bit about DEI and that work in the everyday and what you do, because I also think people are like going to be like, oh my gosh, he went and did this policy work. And he's mm-hmm. done this, right? And I, I can't do that. I mean, you can, people. I'm just going to tell you, you can. Give you <laughs> yeah. And there are ways to incorporate principles of DEI and culturally responsive teaching in everyday interactions with students. And you're probably already doing some of them. I want to talk a little bit around, like, what do you do on the everyday? What are your tips and tricks for educators to do that? I think my biggest tip is pick a principle, right? Accessibility. That's something that we all value. Pick an area of your life and ask yourself, is it accessible to anyone? If anyone were to walk into this door, can they enjoy what I'm enjoying right now? So, for example, with speech and debate, for those who don't know what speech and debate is, it's pretty complicated, so I can't really explain it in this hour. But essentially, (laughs) think of it as competitive public speaking with a little bit of acting, a little bit of debate. 
and a little bit of broadcasting and poetry slams. It's all of that combined. And as a special ed teacher, I always felt like, you know, the kids I teach, they never go out for these clubs and, and activities. And so I just started talking it up. I, t- I teach English. So I'm like, why don't I just tell them about it? Here's what speech and yeah. debate is. Speech and debate, speech and debate. And ever since I started doing that, a lot more kids who I teach have started coming out for the team. And I, I love it. So, for example, two years ago, we had a kid with autism and he wanted to do poetry and he wanted to talk about how people put him in a box and how autism speaks doesn't speak for him. And I thought, it's beautiful. <laughs> and so, and he took mm-hmm. it and he performed it every Saturday like everyone else. And he, was, he did well. And I think people are afraid to open up certain activities to people because they don't want to hurt them. Because in speech and debate, you were literally judged every weekend with Mm -hmm. eye contact, social skills. How are you in the round? Are you behaving? All the things before you even get up to the front to give your speech. And so I I just stopped caring about those things and my worries for him. I just, let's let's do it. And he was embraced by the community. And so that's whatever you are involved in, if you're coaching, is your sport accessible to people of different races, different ethnicities, different abilities, languages? Start there. And then when you get comfortable with those things, then move into the classroom. Are the things you're doing, well, people talk about it five, ten years down the line. You know what I mean? People don't talk about the crucible when they're grown up. <laughs> you know? It was never really about the crucible. It was about this idea of McCarthyism and how lies can ruin people. So is there there another way to drill that into your students without beating the literary canon to death? You could still show them the crucible, but if the kids don't match anyone in the crucible, and honestly, they're Gen Z, a lot of those characters, they don't relate to. And so that's something that my co-teacher and I have been pushing the rest of the department to let go of this literary canon and maybe just Uh, explore other books adjacent. For example, we still do The Great Gatsby, but we do the graphic novel because it's quicker and it's more accessible. That gives us more time to discuss the things I need to know. And then we show the movie and then we read Fences and compare the American Dream across those two different portrayals of the American Dream. And then in my class, I showed the pursuit of happiness because that's more relevant to what they're going through. And so we're still doing the canon. We're just pumping some life into it. And so that's what I recommend people do. If you're afraid of someone, why aren't you teaching this? You can still do it, but just supplement it with some other things too. Yeah, I think that's really important because we should be asking like, why are we using this particular text? Because Mm -hmm. that's what, has traditionally been used i just need you to reflect for a moment what texts were traditionally even allowed right in school so that is how the canon became the canon and there are some great people out there like roberts who's got a book called the novel approach and in it she does like she will take like a canon text and show you here are five or six other books that address this same literary concept (laughs) That are a little bit more relevant to your students. So, I mean, that's my challenge to y'all. You may love of mice and men or whatever book, you know, the horrible great expectations or pride and prejudice. Okay, that's just me talking. I did not. (laughs) Those are not my favorite from English. Um, So now I just talk about them because I didn't like them. And I was the reader, (laughs) y'all. But the why. (laughs) Why are you choosing this text? What is the goal for the reading and learning that's going to come from that. And is this the only way? So I love this idea of y'all are doing multimodal text comparisons. That is critical thinking, reading a novel, regurgitating what happened in the chapter or filling out a fill in the blank. Y'all, this isn't even the point of this podcast today, but I'm going to tell you this. If you're bored with your instruction, so are your students, right? Like that's mm-hmm. boring. Like that's, mm-hmm. that's, it really is. It's boring. You can't expect them to be excited about that. Humans do better when we can connect with the material. And I get it. Not everyone's going to connect with everything, but how are you trying? Yeah. 
You're right. If you're frustrated with the discussion, it means they're not getting it. I was a great reader too. And I don't remember the American dream meaning anything in the great Gatsby. I remember reading it and doing well on the test. But, and so I started teaching it. Me too. It. I'm like, oh, that's the theme. That's one of the things. I, I remember all the figurative language, but I never connected that this was an American dream story until I became an English teacher. So it didn't do what it was supposed to do. I am today do. years old <laughs> and I have a doctorate. Like, oh, he's rich and they're just having a party. And then yeah. there's the light, right? Longing and love. The light. Oh, yeah. Right. Well, and same with the crucible. I remember how it all played out. But to me, it was just a witchcraft spooky story. Maybe, oh. maybe I connected it to McCarthyism, but I still didn't hit this idea that lies can ruin lives and the themes of oh. injustice. And and so I started teaching it and then I felt there's better ways to teach injustice. I didn't get that either. <laughs> and I also read The Crucible and that was my high school's like play at the same time mm -hmm. we were reading it. Went to the play. My One of my best friends in high school at the time was in the play. That's what yeah. I remember the most. Definitely didn't connect it to McCarthyism. Didn't yeah. See? <laughs> so until we started showing the Netflix documentary, the the Khalif Browder documentary. Yes. And then we read our, our primary articles. Um, and kids were just like, wait, this is from this is present? 2016, this actually happened? We're like, yeah. It actually happened. How does Khalif Browder connect to John Proctor? And now they're like, they want to know more about John Proctor. We did that before we read the crucible. So they can see injustice can still happen in modern day. And then it kind of leads to a bigger conversation of why? Why was he treated like this? So yeah, eat free. You can find articles. You don't have to have Netflix. I mean, that was their essay. They had to do a modern day crucible. Right? Give us an essay on someone who's also in modern day been falsely accused of a crime and compare and contrast it to one character from the crucible. Interested in learning more and getting a customized plan for you or your educators? Sign up for a free connection call with me, Dr. Tammy, to discuss your personalized plan. The link is in the show notes. Oh, so, yeah, I like that. That's powerful. Yeah, That's so engaging. those are things anyone can write. Like, and in math, like math is the same, well... It's kind of hard. Math always gets the short end of the stick, the STEM, <laughs> the STEM places. But if you look, NCTM and ICTM, the National Council for Teaching Mathematics, they're yeah. always having webinars on infusing the EI into the curriculum. And there's tons of texts out there. So I don't know. I, I feel like as a math teacher, my biggest thing is just understanding that not everyone has an aptitude for math like I did. I mm -hmm. got there because I had teachers who pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. But I think people who get into teaching math do it because they were great at math. And so it's hard for them to relate to struggling learners. And I think one of the principles of DEI could just be understanding that you might have to make it more accessible. You might have to pre-teach a little bit of standards that aren't your grade level. And that's mm -hmm. okay. You might have to understand that not everyone can go home and do 30 problems with a parent sitting with them at the table and helping. And so maybe that changes how you do you structure your class time. I don't send home any math problems. We do it in class. We start it so I can at least see who gets it, who doesn't. And then we finish, I reteach it or I can move on. And so that's a big pedagogical shift for many math teachers. That is well, rooted in DEI. <laughs> it is. Well, and that's important for so many reasons, because the teaching is supposed to happen in the classroom and the learning is supposed to happen in the classroom where they have the opportunity to ask the questions of the professional in the room. Mm -hmm. Right. And making an assumption that everyone has access to someone to support them at home. And I'm going to even go even a little step further or that they should. Like, why do we send kids to school for eight hours and then want them to go work more mm. when there are other opportunities for them to learn and engage? And maybe that's spending time with their family. Maybe they're trying to do a job. There's so many other things that can happen outside of that time where I think there's just this narrative of homework and you need to have homework because we've always had homework and how do we, you know, learn if you don't have homework? You, 
learn in the classrooms. I would encourage you to reflect on, is that even important? Like yeah. wh the why behind why you're doing homework. And I think that's the hard part too, even for English teachers, right? Mm -hmm. I have an unpopular opinion because I used to study literacy and reading. I was a ELA teacher. Not everyone is going to love to read. Yeah. And not everyone is going to be a reader for fun. People like different things and choose to spend their time in different things. Now, are we giving them access to choose to be able to do that and the skills to be able to do that if they want to for reading or math? And are we checking our bias when it comes to reading and math? Because also we think certain students, girls, students of color are not good at math, not smart at math or mm -hmm. not good at reading, mm -hmm. right? Or we over interrupt students that we feel need support versus letting them work on Produ the learning. Productively struggle through. Yeah, yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. There's so much research about how often students that are trying to have productive struggle that are perceived to be quote unquote lower level learners are interrupted than students that are quote unquote perceived to be high learners. They're not yeah. interrupted and they're allowed to like work through that thinking process. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad that came up in this podcast. That's something else you all should Google if you're a STEM teacher. Productive struggle, math trauma, math anxiety, the learning pit. Those are all things that you could that can shift your teaching and uh, making your class more accessible, especially if you are frustrated right now. It's probably because your kids aren't giving enough time to productively struggle. That's the only way to learn something. That's how we learn how to drive. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> that's how I learned how to drive. At Look, least. <laughs> it is also Thanks, a Mom. productive struggle being the parent in the seat. Let me tell yes. you, I've done it twice now. <laughs> Woo! But, but yes, most things that is how trial and error and everyone can relate to their parent or someone telling them, this is really the best advice and you should probably do X. Yep. And you didn't choose X. You chose Y. Yep. Because <laughs> you thought you'd do better. But you learned something from that because you didn't. So yeah. you're there to guide. You're a facilitator. You're a guide that helps them move through the learning that is there for them. Yeah. Even that is a shift. Mathematics teaching is very lecture-based. And I think it's okay, y'all, to just step back and let learning happen and then jump in and facilitate with, as needed. That's still good teaching. You don't have to talk for 40 minutes. And that's how we learn. But like, that's just not, it's not, can't happen. I know. I would <laughs> say, you know who should be really tired at the end of the day? The students. The students should be tired at the end of the day because they've been engaging in the productive struggle, in the mm -hmm. learning, right? They should be more tired than you. I love that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Wow, we've talked about a lot of really yeah. amazing <laughs> things and so many. And I know we've dropped some resources and places to go look at. I, I'll grab all of those, y'all, for the show notes so you can go back and find mm -hmm. them because I want you to go use them because these are good tools, tips, and tricks. Want to think about, Brandon, what's your next step and what's one tip takeaway that you want to share with the listeners? Sure. So I think my next step is my blackness is it's on me right you can see like oh he's black and so it was easy to lean into that work i think i want to embrace my queerness right as a gay male and and i'm in a position of influence and so how can i help shift minds to understand those microaggressions because i mean i still hear kids say that's gay or they throw out the f slur like it's candy, like it's a parade. Everyone gets to go in the hall. Everyone called that, and especially our male to male, and that's and their friends. They just that is how they talk to each other. They don't think it's mm -hmm. bad, and so I really want to encourage myself to do the work, especially for our trans brothers and sisters, and you know, like pronouns. We all at this point in education, we all have pronouns in our signature. But what does it really mean? If someone were to ask me, why do you have pronouns in your in your signature? I probably couldn't give them an eloquent answer. And so I need to do more soul searching, I suppose, more research. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid. That's the biggest tip. Don't be afraid to admit. I don't know. Let me go think about that. I need to figure out why I don't know about that lens of DEI. And 
I, I think that's okay. Teachers, we're learners. And the reason that we're great at our job is because we're great at taking what we know and, and telling it to other people. And I think with DEI, you don't have to have a DEI lesson, but all the examples we shared in this podcast are ways you can infuse it into your teaching and into your life. And so even if you don't think you have diversity in your life, you do. Everyone has something unique about themselves. Mm -hmm. You're from a small town and now you're teaching at a city. People can't relate to that small town mentality. So teach them about that because when they graduate, they might move to a small town. Your gender, your gender identity, we're all different. So I don't be afraid to share some of that because you're going to reach someone who probably hasn't been seen yet. Oh, I love that. Yes, I love that. By sharing yourself, you provide space for others to also be seen. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And that's okay. You're not, it's not against the law. <laughs> it is not. It is, yeah, not. it is not. None of this is against the law. None of it None is. Of it's None of it is. Law. Well, Brandon, I want to thank you so much for joining me today and having this great conversation. Listeners, I'm going to drop those references in the show notes so you can access them. Please go check out Brandon's Instagram page because he's also just told you that it is public so you can check it out. And if you have any questions or want to get uh, started with some DEI work, please reach out to me and schedule a time. And remember, share this podcast with your educator friends and use your voice. Thanks, Brandon. Thank you. This wraps up another episode of the Equity Hour podcast with me, your host, Dr. Tammy Dean. Make sure to check out the show notes for any resources, links, and next steps from today's episode. Head on over to Instagram and give us a follow at Dragonfly Rising LLC for more tips, resources, and opportunities to connect. Thank you so much for joining us. And remember, intent is not enough. Action is necessary. How will you use your voice today?